I'm going to play beautiful music. That wasn't very convincing, was it? Hi, my name's Jackie Sharp, and today I'd like to talk to you about shaping phrases in music. Just like speech, music is a language. When we speak, we shape our sentences. And in music, we shape our phrases. We do this in order to communicate to other people thoughts and feelings. So let me go back to my original sentence. I'm going to play beautiful music. I'm going to say it again now in a different way. And I want you to just take a little look at this image as I'm saying it. I'm going to play beautiful music. When I said it, I believe you would have had the impression that I am a confident person and that I'm confident that the music that I play will indeed be beautiful. So one more time. I'm going to play beautiful music. Let's try it a different way. Let's take a look at image number two. I am going to play beautiful music. I am going to play beautiful music. When you hear that, it kind of makes you think, hmm, maybe she's not all that confident. Maybe she thinks that the music is not going to be all that good. Now let's try a third way. I'm going to play beautiful music. I'm going to play beautiful music. This time, I believe it sounds like I'm a person who loves to play music and I really believe it's beautiful. And through the rise and fall of my intonation in that sentence, you can hear that I love it. When we play piano, it's the same thing. I'm going to be demonstrating this today on through a list. The equivalent of a sentence, a long sentence in music, is a phrase. Um, within the phrase, we might have small little bits, chunks, called motifs. So if I just play without any expression, the first motif in through release, we have... If I want to try and give it this shape... It's going to sound like this. Notice that rise and fall. And that gave it a feeling of warmth and tenderness. Again. All too often, students play this shape. which sounds like again believe me the moment teachers and examiners hear that we very often want to run out of the room so back to our first shape we increase and we decrease so moving on we've, we've dealt with the first motif um, now, we have a couple of possibilities of how to deal with the second motive. Um, so basically, we have... Then we have... So essentially, we have... The same type of motive appear twice. We can either deal with it as another slurred type of figure, rising and falling, so... Uh, or, so that would look visually represented like that. Or, we can deal with it as... Whichever 
way you choose to do, it doesn't really matter because they both make musical sense. They are both musical interpretations. And that's what it's really all about. It's, it's you interpreting, you making a choice that you think is going to be the best reflection of the mood of the music, of what the music is trying to convey. Um, now, in terms of long phrase, we move on. We never want to change, we never want to have an angular sound at the end, so we always want to keep that similar. But this one is right at the end of that small subsection, and so it must drop. So we have that type of representation. So if I play through from the beginning, I'll do the two different ways and just listen for the differences. So the difference is only in the second motive, the way I'm doing the repeated version of it. So. how you're trying to interpret um, and you give thought into every note that you play. Now I'd like to invite you to take a Google challenge. Just go onto Google, Google for release, uh, watch some professionals playing and listen critically. Listen very carefully, try to imagine the shapes of their phrasing and you'll hear that everything is thought through that they're doing. Then you go and watch some little kids playing um, and I'm sure that you're going to find a lot of... And then you can just smile and you can know, well, I'm never going to make that mistake. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed it. Bye!